we're gonna we're gonna get going in just a second. I, I don't know where Councillor Outed went, but I think we're gonna. He's right here. Good. <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're all here and assembled, those that are coming today, or, except Tim's leaving again, but that's fine. Uh, so I'm going to call this meeting to order, if I may, and I'm going to start by acknowledging that Halifax Regional Municipality is located in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and traditional lands of the Mi'kmaq people, and the municipality acknowledges the peace and friendship treaties signed in this territory, uh, and, and we recognize that we haven't uh, always done the best job with that, and we're working harder, and uh, uh, we recognize we're all treaty people. I'd like to uh, thank Mayor Savage for joining us because we have some young folks in the audience today who are excited to meet the mayor, so he's come to say hi to them. And just as long as you don't disrupt my meeting. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Uh, so today, today uh, point, of point of order. Yes, sir, Mr. Mayor. Anything for you, sir. Uh, so before we get to the business at hand, I want to welcome our new, uh, well, our returning member, Councillor Outhead is here, uh, and myself, and we have new members. Uh, uh, Councillor Purdy is here, uh, Councillor Cleary and Councillor uh, Lovelace have joined us uh, for, uh, as we uh, reappoint the committees every two years. Uh, we're also going to be joined by Councillor Cuddle, who sends her regrets today. So uh, that's our new committee. Thank you all for coming to this. Uh, and uh, thank you to Councillor Stoddard, Kent, Mancini, and Russell, who uh, served in the past. Our staff today are Katie Hamble as the LA, Colin Taylor as our solicitor, and uh, Brad Anguish sitting in for the CAO. Uh, the yeah, and, uh, yeah, and if uh, oxygen mass drops, no, we're, we're all good. So uh, what we're going to do now is I'm going to pass the, uh, the uh, floor to the legislative assistant who will run us through the election of chair. Awesome. Thank you very much. So at this time, we're going to do the election of chair. This happens annually. So I will look for a nomination for chair. Councillor Cleary? I'd like to nominate, actually, uh, Councillor Mason to stay in the chair. Awesome. Councillor Mason, do you accept the nomination? I accept. Awesome. Are there any further nominations? Any further nominations? Last and final time, any further nominations? Awesome. And Councillor Mason, we just need a vote, actually, now. He's acclaimed. Okay, we're good. <laughs> awesome. And then we'll hand it back to you. Thank you, Katie, and thank you, Council, for giving me a, or committee for giving me another two years. Uh, I will now open the floor for nominations for position of vice chair. Councilor Purdy. Thank you very much. I would like to nominate Councilor Lovelace. Councilor Lovelace has been nominated, seconded by Councilor Cleary. Are there any further nominations? Are there any further nominations? Are there any further nominations? Seeing none, you are claimed. Can't keep a good past deputy mayor down. Thank you for joining us, uh, Councillor Lovelace. Uh, so uh, to our young friends in the audience, I would say when you get to junior high and high school and people are saying, do you want to do model parliament or model UN? And, and some of your friends are saying, that's not cool. That's actually very useful if you ended up in a job like this. We use it every day here. So uh, uh, happy to talk to you guys about it after the meeting. Uh, so we now have a chair and a vice chair. Uh, and Stop it. Uh, so we'll now move to approval of minutes from October 27th, 2022. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the minutes? Moved by Councillor Outhit, seconded by Councillor Purdy. Any further discussion on the minutes? Seeing none, we'll move to a vote. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. We're going to move to approval of the order of business, item three, and approval of additions and deletions. We'll go first to the clerk, Madam Clerk. There are no additions or deletions. Uh, there are no additions and deletions. Are there any uh, uh, changes that uh, council would, committee would request? Seeing none, uh, look for a motion move to move as presented. Uh, I want to acknowledge, so moved by Councillor Cleary, seconded by yeah. Councillor Outhit. 
the uh, I want to acknowledge that there were two, two there were three groups that asked to speak today, and one of them we turned down because two groups were scheduled to speak today, but then one of them wasn't able to come at the last minute. So I don't want anybody out there who was upset they weren't able to present today to wonder why there aren't, aren't aren't two groups. We did try that, and I also want to acknowledge right now before we go to a vote that I have spoken to Director Anguish, Executive Director Anguish, and a lot of questions came from the public and from members of council around the AAA bike network delays and and to, to we didn't really have time after a 10 hour council meeting to dig down into that kind of stuff. And so I have asked that in the next meeting that uh, uh, Public Works come forward with uh, the parts of the presentation that were unable to fit into the council meeting and, and, and the information that some of council has seen, but I think all of council should see and that's been agreed to. So I thank you for that. So we have a motion on the floor for approving the business, uh, order of business without amendment. Questions. Questions been called, all those in favor? Opposed? Carries unanimously. Thank you. There's no business arising out of the minutes, so I will call for a declaration of conflict of interest. Seeing none, we'll move on. There are no motions of reconsideration or rescission. There's no deferred business. There are no notice of tabled matters, which brings us to item 10, correspondence 10.1. Madam Clerk, uh, can you uh, tell us about the correspondence received? We've received no correspondence. Which is unusual for this committee. Thank you for that. Uh, Petitions, 10.2, are there any petitions? No petitions. Do members of the committee have any petitions to present at this time? Seeing none, thank you for that. We'll uh, move on to 10.3, presentations. The folks who did come, and we're glad to see you all, uh, the Hubbard Streetscape Project are here. If you would uh, come forward and uh, fire up the uh, PowerPoint and introduce yourselves. Uh, but it's nice to see you both, Paul and Melanie, from my point of view, so thanks for coming. Okay. Good afternoon to the committee and municipal staff. My name is Paul Datz, and I'm a planner with Upland Planning and Design. Um, I'm Melanie McIver, and I oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm Melanie McIver, and I'm one of the co-chairs for the Hubbard Streetscape Project. Thank you for inviting us to present on the Hubbard's Community Plan. The Hubbard's Community Plan, which is the subject of this presentation, is uh, in its full length uploaded um, to the website onehubbards.org. Um, all the details of the plan uh, can be seen there. It is a very special document because it was prepared um, and initiated by the local community and is being brought forward now to, uh, to the city, uh, to committees, uh, to consider its recommendations. Um, before we get um, further into the presentation, I would like to invite you to reflect on what kind of community Hubbard's is. Uh, Hubbard's has uh, commercial uh, facilities, there are recreational amenities, uh, there is a branch of the Halifax libraries, there is a community waterfront, uh, museums, uh, other institutional facilities. Uh, a shore club and a sailing club among the institutional items. So it has all the ingredients of a complete community. And um, with a population of almost 1,200 residents, it is actually, it has all the characteristics that would be typical elsewhere in Nova Scotia for a, for a small town or a village. But what's different about Hubbard's is that it's situated on a municipal boundary between the Halifax Regional Municipality and the municipality on the district of Chester, and is therefore administratively uh, split into two parts. Um, the other part that's also different about such a complete community with all of these amenities is that at active transportation infrastructure is virtually non-existent. There are 400 meters of sidewalk on the side of the municipality of Chester, and otherwise there are no um, active transportation features other than, than the Rum Runners or St. Margaret's Bay um, Railway Trail, um, which I will point out in, in a little bit. So this specific uh, situation has motivated a group of very dedicated volunteers um, to raise funds and in partnership with the Espotogan Heritage Trust uh, hire uh, a planning consultant, um, Upland Planning and Design, who I'm uh, representing, to create a cohesive community plan for all of Hubbard's. 
And before they, before they reached out uh, to work with a planning firm on this plan, uh, the first thing they did is to, um, to go out to their neighbors and to canvas all of these streets uh, and, and roads in Hubbards, which you can see on the map. Uh, and they, they spoke to all of their community members, neighbors along those roads, and, and asked them questions about what is important to you uh, for a future of Hubbards. And the two things that, that really stood out in these conversations was, number one, um, there is a very strong feeling that, that there is a need for improvements in active transportation and pedestrian safety uh, for the residents. And the other part, which we more so discussed um, last week in the Community Planning and Economic Development Standing Committee, is uh, feelings about uh, growth uh, with the highway twinning uh, ending now at, uh, at exit 6 in Hubbards. Um, people have feelings about growth uh, and generally they're welcoming to growth and, and feel it's a good thing, but there are concerns about growth with, without a plan. Um, with that feedback, uh, the Hubbard Streetscape project um, has created two pillars of, of the Hubbard's community plan, the pedestrian safety and active uh, in active transportation improvements pillar and community development. So those were the two priorities uh, for this plan. So then uh, we got hired and got involved and um, from the beginning we started a very comprehensive engagement, um, set, set of public engagement activities. I would argue it was maybe one of the most comprehensive engagement efforts specifically tailored to and dedicated to Hubbards. There was a launch week with lots of social media content. There was an interactive map where um, residents could, could place comments specific to a certain locations, online discussion groups, stakeholder workshops, uh, inclusion interviews. There was a, a focus group with youth where we could chat with, with children and teenagers about how they get to move around in Hubbards. Uh, and there was also a collaboration committee set up with staff uh, from the province, from the municipality of Chester and HRM. Uh, all of that started uh, approximately in May of last year. Uh, this formative engagement phase uh, had a lot of these um, components I just mentioned until about July. We were working then through the fall of last year on the plan, coordinated the draft documents uh, with the municipalities and the province um, this, uh, yeah, this winter. Um, and, and after fine tuning some of the contents, we went public with the draft plan in March. Um, gathered another round of feedback from the public on those and then proceeded to create a final document which is now available on the One Hubbard's website. Um, the main items of feedback uh, we received during the public engagement were very similar to um, what HSP has already heard in the initial conversations with residents, road safety, active transportation improvements, and a lot of specific locations that, that are worth being improved actually came out in these conversations and are summarized on this slide for the record. And that brings us to the actual plan. So based on that public feedback, we have created um, the Hubbard's community plan. And before diving into active transportation improvements, the, the first thing we did is to create uh, a community structure that intentionally um, disregarded the community boundary and property boundaries, but we really looked at the urban structure of the community, uh, what kind of areas emerge where, and, um, and what would be an ideal setting for Hubbards to develop in the future. And having defined those, then we looked at how are people likely in the future are going to move around this community. And what we recognized clearly um, is that because of the geography of Hubbards with the cove splitting the community in, in two halves, St. Margaret's Bay Road has a very uh, key role to uh, bringing people safely from one end of the community to the other. So before any other active transportation improvements are being done, that is really the backbone of the system that needs to be in place first. Um, connections around the cove are then the next step and finally there are um, um, all kinds of additional desirable links to important uh, buildings and properties in, in the community. So um, we came up then with a program in this plan called uh, the six big moves. 
Um, and I will focus on the three uh, which have a focus on um, active transportation. So the first one is the Hubbard's Loop, outlined in light blue. Um, it, it is creating a, a parallel kind of branch of the Rum Runners Trail. Uh, why is that important? Because through the public engagement we have learned that even though there is this trail going through the community, it, is, it feels fairly remote. It is, um, well, literally kind of set back in the woods. And um, members of the community don't feel comfortable sending their children to school on that trail, for instance, right? It, it feels too remote, not well supervised. Um, so therefore, there is a very strong desire to have an active uh, transportation backbone on the main street of the community, St. Margaret's Bay Road. And at the same time, this will also um, have two other good effects. For one, it will draw bicycle tourism onto the main street and help businesses. And it will create the so-called Hubbard's Loop that allows um, residents to use that for, for jogging or walking as a loop for recreational purposes. Other than that, we have identified uh, sidewalk extensions that are important and what we call cove connections, which is creating this horseshoe of, um, of active transportation improvements around the cove. And looking at uh, more details, we have worked quite a bit on design principles for safe active transportation infrastructure and what they could look like in, in Hubbards. There is uh, quite a bit of detail in that in the full plan document. Just to show an example, uh, for instance, one of the principles we're bringing forward is reduce the amount, the distance of um, that pedestrians need to cross when, when going from one side of the road to the other. Um, so, so sidewalk bump outs are are uh, one means to do that. Also by squaring up intersections that are at awkward angles, uh, there is a possibility to, to make those safer by just creating uh, more and improved sight lines around intersections. And then using those principles and, and the feedback from the engagement, we have actually come up with a first conceptual model of what all of this could look like. Um, that is, it, it's not a final design that would have been fully coordinated with staff, but it is a, there was coordination with staff and it, it, has, it is a conceptual level which, which uh, can be further built upon. So um, at the boundary between HRM um, and Chester, that's where the current sidewalk from the municipality of Chester ends. Um, so the phasing which we have outlined in the project uh, would foresee that the first step of the active transportation improvements would, to, would be to build the sidewalk um, on the southern side of St. Margaret's Bay Road leading from the intersection with Fox Point Front Road where it currently the sidewalk ends to the community waterfront. Um, so you can see the, the community waterfront across the street um, is the branch of the uh, Halifax libraries. There's a post office. So this is kind of the core of the community where everything happens and where uh, active transportation is, is about the most vital. Um, so that's, that's where we suggest the sidewalk extension could end. And then on the other side of the street, on the northern side, for um, the next, one of the next phases of improvements would be to create um, that um, multi-use path that uh, branches out from, from the Rum Runners Trail and connects uh, the core of the community to the elementary school. That, um, that connection you can see uh, here on this slide with the elementary school being on the right uh, boundary of, of this map. Um, yeah, and, and the trail um, reaching all the way there. Um, on the other side of the cove, um, there is Shore Club Road, which is a very small, windy road, um, which feels very unsafe to a lots, of, lots of residents because there is uh, a lot of tourist traffic uh, and a lot of pedestrian traffic ma mixed throughout most of the, of the season. So, um, so for that area, we suggest... Uh, I just got the pained look that I haven't been keeping track of time, so I think you got 30 seconds left. Okay, okay. Uh, there is, uh, we're suggesting a boardwalk for that and um, continuing over uh, to a sidewalk um, further down to, to the Shore Club Road, uh, to the Shore Club. And um, I'll just hand it over real quick uh, to Melanie McIver for, for some calls from the community. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll just be brief. We were here for CPED and um, we had a motion put forward that a staff report would be um, put forth um, and it was hoping to incorporate active transportation staff as well. And I believe with uh, my communication with some of the staff already that might be happening and 
really that that's the point of the presentation is to ensure that the work that the community has done thus far with the planners and all of our efforts with volunteering and raising funds and stuff like that isn't going um, without a point and we really want to make sure that we can somehow keep the plan moving forward in its best efficient way. So it's really why we're here today to, to talk about how do we move this forward for our community. Um, you know, what do we have to do as a community to um, engage with HRM a little bit more to ensure that something can, can occur. Thank you. Uh, any questions of clarification, comments? I was stretching so Pam could get on the list. Go ahead, uh, uh, Councillor Lovelace. Thank you. Yes, I hit my button, but then it turned off again. Uh, thank you so much for being here today. I am pleased to be a member of this committee uh, and have the uh, opportunity to assist in moving this forward uh, at the municipality. Um, certainly, I was uh, happy to uh, contribute funds from District 13 towards uh, this plan. And uh, it is Im important uh, on a number of reasons, but you know, this is, this is an incredibly complex uh, project uh, with two municipal units, one provincial government, um, staff on other, and, and each of those uh, orders of, of government. Um, and as we've recently saw the removal of, of, a, of a wonderful loved crosswalk in Hubbard's uh, by the province uh, certainly hit us in a very difficult spot, wondering if we would be able to advance uh, pedestrian safety. So, you know, when I, when I, when I, when I look at some of the opportunities that we have in this plan, I also have to be cognizant of the fact that, you know, yes, there are some limitations as far as the municipality's jurisdiction uh, within provincial right-of-ways. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, there have been improvements such as dropping the short club road down to 40 kilometers an hour, which we saw the province do. Um, and staff will continue to work uh, with provincial staff. Um, but, you know, when we have things like motorized vehicles on um, the St. Mary's Bay Rails to Trails, it is a significant impediment for parents to say to their kids, hey, just walk on the trail. Um, you know, and as you've uh, indicated, it's not safe. But my question to you is, can you talk to me a little bit about the conversations that you've had with the province in regards to stormwater infrastructure? Um, because Shankill Road in particular is one of those roads that continue, uh, we continue to see erosion of that uh, shoulder because of the lack of effective uh, stormwater um, infrastructure on that road in particular. Thank you. Uh, so we have not discussed those issues directly with the province besides um, fixing walking space that was washed out, right. which they were very quick to come and um, fix for us and it was quite lovely. We were happy with that. But with regards to like actual infrastructure underneath, um, we haven't had that discussion because as a community member, we don't think about it like that. We think about it like, why can't I walk here? Mm -hmm. Why is the shoulder of the road so small? And why are the cars going so fast? And why is there no place to actually uh, stroll a stroller or ride a scooter? Mm -hmm. Or um, So we don't really think about it in that same lens. Uh, and our plan didn't incorporate that because we were going for an active transportation and community placemaking plan. Right, so that's good. So Mr. Chair, that's something that we'll bring forward with staff because we do need to have uh, a comprehensive stormwater management plan in order to, uh, to, to realize some of these uh, wonderful initiatives. I just want to say thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, so uh, I'm going to go to uh, Brad Anguish, the Director of Public Works, Executive Director of Public Works, who has uh, a question for you. Actually, thank you. Tremendous presentation. Uh, my, in my portfolio is the active transportation portfolio, so I appreciate this presentation. Just a follow-on question to where Councillor Lovelace was going. Have you had discussions with the province around the realignment of the road infrastructure, which is obviously absolutely key to your plan, and have you had any indications of when that could occur? Um, to the first question, yes, absolutely. So as part of the collaboration committee, we were discussing the document in, in quite some detail. Uh, essentially, the province is, is waiting for the initiative from the municipality to come up come in with an, with an application and a design how to you know redesign that 
that road, uh, including the active transportation infrastructure, and then that will open for them the process to, to review and, and comment and so on. Generally, on a conceptual level, they're on board with what's happening. And also, uh, further to, to Councillor Lovelace's um, question about we didn't talk about stormwater management on Shankill Road, but we did talk about the necessity uh, that, that installing sidewalks will also have a stormwater management component in there. So we talked about that. Uh, question two, as for timelines, no indication so far. It's, it's complex, right? Thank you. That confirms what I would have expected. Um, just for the benefit of the committee, <clears throat> um, you do have uh, staff deliverables to you on both the Active Transportation Priorities Plan for Rural Communities, that is coming in January uh, to aid you with budget discussions, as well as your um, uh, policy uh, enactment of the funding of rural transportation, um, uh, currently directed by area rate and other sources. So you will have both of those pieces, hopefully at the same meeting in January, ahead of the finalization of the budget. So just to add to this. Thank you. Well, thank you, Executive Director. We will go to Councilor Lovelace. Thank you. Just to add on to uh, what Brad has said, in addition to that, we will have a better understanding from the province as far as what they will permit uh, on their roadway as a meeting is, is imminent and it has been scheduled, um, I believe, next week. And so we'll have a clear understanding from Nova Scotia Public Works what can actually happen uh, under their uh, auspices and, and authority. Go ahead. Sorry. I'm not sure how this works. <laughs> um, I think from a community point of view, I just want to, um, especially for this piece of the project, I just want to express that um, kind of what we're asking for is, it, we're, we're asking for help how to move it forward, but we're asking for help how to move it forward the right way. Because since we're working with two municipalities, mm -hmm. the provincial agreements with each municipality is different. And I, as a community resident, have zero idea what they are or how to navigate them. And I'm really struggling, and we are all as a committee, really struggling with like how to kind of make that cohesive uh, piece move forward or one person be in charge and, and know what that one side has to tell another side because there's two municipalities and one province. So it's just like, it's a little confusing. And I think that um, if we had a staff member who could work with the municipality of Chester staff, it would help us a lot continue that drive to move the project forward within the community. Um, just with regards to the staff itself, it's a little bit challenging because we don't know all the policies and the rules and how they differ. So like we get one policy from one side and we're like, okay, this is what we can do, we can do it. And then we find out that we can't do it the same way on the other side and it's super confusing. Yeah. Dr. English. I appreciate that and I empathize with it. <clears throat> we will do our best. Um, the key thing here is to remember is that, and this is with all our rural communities, I'm sure you know this, the province owns that right of way. So all discussions have to vet through them in order for us to know where we're going, both municipalities. So I'm glad to hear about the meeting. I look forward to hearing what came of that. Um, I take your point and we'll, uh, we'll make sure that that uh, turns into a three-party conversation. Thank you. And if I may, from the seat here, you know, I've been supporting this for some time. It's great to see you again. And Paul, it's great to, I don't think I've seen you in this capacity yet, actually, so nice to see you again. Uh, the, uh, the thing that I think uh, you've heard me say before is Wolfville didn't happen in a day. I'm just barely old enough to remember when it was more strip molly and not New England towny. And it, it was deliberate investments by the town and by the businesses over decades to get to a place where they've managed to turn it back into what everybody always wanted it to be. And, and, and while you know, Hubbard's doesn't have quite the density of Main Street Wolfville, the, the, you, you need to take deliberate action to make these kind of changes happen. And, and I think modest municipal investments over time, and I like how you're prioritizing the safety first part before we get to the, the other parts. So I think that's really important. And Director Anguish already stole my thunder because uh, the, uh, 
we have a similar request from Muscadab at Harbor and what's holding up like moving forward and that has been that the drainage, which Councillor Lovelace brought up, is doing a comprehensive drainage study for a kilometer and a half of road that you don't own, right, that belongs to the province to make sure that we don't put a sidewalk there and then flood the road or have it freeze and turn into a sheet of ice. That's, that's non-trivial, so that works underway and will probably have to happen here. Uh, and uh, so my, I, I do have a question, which is on your last slide, and you can tell where I'm going with this as soon as I say it, at the bottom you said taxes, question mark. Could you unpack that a little bit and tell us what you mean by that? Because that is actually, just to cut to the chase, that is the biggest issue we have right now is how we're going to pay for ongoing maintenance. It was extraordinary to do that in Sheet Harbor with the area rate. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that, what, what, what you're indicating by that. So um, one of the considerations is once again, um, Half of our community lives on HRM and half of our community doesn't. And if one municipality decides to impose an, um, an area rate and the other municipality doesn't, um, how are we going to navigate that within our community? Because that's impactful for where people live. Like, you know, your, the county line is in the middle. And if you were going to buy a house and your area rate uh, was added onto your taxes in HRM or vice versa or whatever, it might dictate where you choose to purchase, purchase your land. And then, and then ultimately, it would dictate where the center of the community lies in the end. Um, so we're trying to be mindful of that. We did have the opportunity to ask people at the beginning when we were doing our first surveying how they felt about an area rate. Um, we were going based off of what Sheet Harbor's error rate was because we consider ourselves similar to them um, and it was not a, like people weren't obviously, they weren't jumping for joy but they weren't negative about it because they recognize that Hubbard's is, I like to say unique maybe because I live there but <laughs> um, you really don't have to leave Hubbard's to get everything you need. I'm, I'm not kidding. Everything is in there. We have it all and um, so you don't have to have a car. So to to have a sidewalk near your house, you, you do use it, you want to use it. Um, so they weren't opposed to the idea of having it. Uh, but but I, our polling was only in that area that we did. And um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a city official, so I, I probably didn't do it the best way it could have been done. Um, and I'm sure it's a further discussion that needs to happen. But the consideration of the two municipalities uh, matters in that sense as well. Thank you very much for that clarity and, and yeah, joint uh, coordination on the periphery. I think we also have that up uh, as you approach Elmsdale is, is uh, challenging, continues to be challenging around all the things. We didn't even talk about fire. So thank you very much for coming today. We really appreciate it and the board is clear. So we'll let you get on with your day and uh, uh, we look forward to, you may want to come in January, at least watch on YouTube when we're talking about the rural AT stuff. So thank you both. All right, uh, let's uh, move on now. That's it for presentations today. There's no information items under item 11, which brings us to item 12 reports, 12.11 amendments to bylaw T1000 taxi broker fee system. Uh, do we have a presentation? Are we going, we have a presentation today? Excellent, well, come on down. Sorry, I'm, I'm a lot more informal than some. Please go ahead. <laughs> Am I turned on here? Um, good afternoon, my name is Tanya Snare. I'm the Regional Licensing Supervisor with Planning and Development. Today's presentation outlines the amendments to T1000, our taxi bylaw, and our Administrative Order 39, uh, requested by the Transportation Standing Committee. On April 29th, 2021, a motion was passed to amend the bylaw and the administrative order to ensure fairness in the process of becoming a taxi driver uh, and through a transportation standing committee or transportation network company, or also known as the TNCs. This includes a request to examine the, examine the fees for both uh, for the taxi brokers as well as TNC companies. So the presentation will include staff recommendations, the background of why the amendments would be a benefit to both the drivers and brokers, 
and the proposed amendments to T1000 and the Administrative Order 39. The recommendation is as follows, that the Transportation Standing Committee recommend that Halifax Regional Council direct the Chief Administrative Officer to draft amendments to bylaw T1000 and Administrative Order 39 as set out in attachment A of this report. A bit of background, as previously mentioned, on April 29, 2021, a motion was passed to amend the bylaw and administrative order to ensure fairness in the process to become a taxi driver versus a driver through the TNC. This included a request to review the potential of making changes to existing process and the courses completed to, or by drivers to align more with the TNC companies. Finally, it was also a request that staff examine the fees paid by both taxi brokers as well as the TNC companies. Staff have met with industry and uh, received feedback, which was uh, that the current requirements to become a driver are extremely outdated, very time consuming and costly to drivers. It takes on average about two months just to complete all the requirements needed to apply for the conditional license. This includes completing an English test, getting a criminal record check and a child abuse registry check, requesting a driver's abstract and getting passport photos. Each has a time frame of its own before they are received and the this is before the application can even be started. Once the application is started, they have to take three knowledge exams through uh, Tourism Industry Association of Nova Scotia, also known as tie-ins. This also covers our bylaw and our AO39, streets and roads, as well as buildings and common locations. TNC drivers are not required to complete this testing, only taxi drivers which are, is at a current cost of $207 to the driver. With the new use of GPS technology, the questions within the current tests are outdated and really unnecessary. Which uh, once each exam is passed, they have to get a 70% pass for each test. They become a conditional driver, then are required to do, uh, be part of the national certificate program that then requires them to get 600 driving hours and then pass another exam, the national exam, before they are able to become a permanent driver. Again, not this is not a requirement of the TNC drivers. This would also improve licensing times, reduce regulatory burden of taxi drivers and align with the TNC drivers. Just to give an overview, of the TNC driver requirements. TNC driver licenses are legislated by the province. Currently, the province requires individuals to have a class four license to operate. At this time, a class four license is required to become a TNC driver with a three year driver experience. They require criminal record and child abuse registry check, registry check along with a driver's abstract. This is the extent of the requirements for a driver with a TNC company. Drivers do not need to be licensed through HRM, only through that TNC company. The next thing we'd like to do is have a removal of the winter driving course. The winter driving course is redundant. It provides information and tips about driving on roads during the winter months, but it does not include any hands-on driving in vehicle. It is a current charge of $50 and holds no value to the driver. This course is not a requirement of a TNC driver and it is not completed through any other jurisdictions. <clears throat> Removal of the driver exams, knowledge exams through tie-ins. We are recommending the removal of the current exam However, we're also looking to add a new program to be implemented, which is more up to date and specific to the role of a driver and their interaction with customers. 
this wouldn't, <coughs> excuse me, this wouldn't be an amendment to the current bylaw as it specifies testing is a requirement, but nothing specific to the type. With the implementation of GPS and tablets and taxis, there's no longer a need to know where specific streets are, buildings or where tourist attractions are. These locations are simply entered, <coughs> excuse me, are simply entered and the most reliable route given, which is also part of our legislation requirements. The existing streets, roads, buildings, common location exams have always been a struggle for potential drivers because we really don't have any testing material or study materials available. Knowing and understanding the bylaw and the AO is the responsibility of the driver as well as the brokers and really shouldn't be part of our testing. <coughs> Excuse me. Although there will likely be a cost for the new training program, there will still be a savings to the driver by moving into this new option, which will further align with the drivers and their interactions with the customers. Uh, I'm not sure if this was used or not. <laughs> Thank you. It's okay, Tim. Brad's getting it for us. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> well, hey. <laughs> make it a very interesting meeting. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so really until a new program is implemented, we will continue with the current testing through times uh, to ensure continuity. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks. <laughs> So the new training program, as previously mentioned, while we are recommending the removal of the current knowledge exams, there is a more centralized, we we're looking at a more centralized program. This will replace, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> this will replace the current exams that we have today um, and the requirement for the national certification program. So we'll include topics such as understanding uh, the dimensions of diversity and inclusion, how to interact with customers, which will include um, those with disabilities and working with service dogs, customer service, ethics, as well as code of conduct within our bylaw. An RFP has been drafted for diversity and culture uh, awareness training, which would be paid directly to our supplier this is going to be released uh, once further direction is received from this report to ensure that we there is no further needed for our tender process. This training will provide tools that will be needed uh, to provide a quality service standard to our customers and is more closely aligned with our TNC drivers. To have a look at our driver fees, Drivers with the TNC do not pay the high fees that our taxi drivers do today. As mentioned, they need their criminal record check, child abuse registry, and driver's abstract, which comes at a cost of $69. TNC companies pay an amount dependent on the number of vehicles, which we'll see on the next slide. Drivers, however, pay for their English proficiency test, 10350. Criminal record check is 50. Their child abuse registry is free. Driver's abstract, 19. Passport photos are 20. Application fee, 50. Testing, 207. Winter driving test, 50. And the renewal fee, 100. This is a total of $599.50. This is a difference between the current and recommended changes to bylaw being about $307. To become a taxi driver versus a TNC driver is a difference of $530. As far as TNC versus brokers, our current amount that our TNC is paying right now they fall in the last um, last section here. They have over 100 vehicles, so they're paying $25,000. Taxi brokers pay an annual fee of 300. 
However, we are recommending no changes at this time. We would like to look at this again in the future. In conclusion, staff is recommending that the Transportation Standing Committee recommend that Re Halifax Regional Council direct the Chief Administrative Officer to draft amendments to Bylaw T-1000 and Administrative Order 39 as set out in Attachment A of this report. Thank you, Ms. Nair. That was great. All things considered, you take a moment to compose yourself. Uh, we. Uh, uh, so thank you very much for that. I need uh, a member of committee to put this on the floor. We'll go to Councillor Cleary. Be happy to. Uh, I move that the Transportation Standing Committee recommend that Halifax Regional Council direct the Chief Administrative Officer to draft amendments to Bylaw T-1000 and Administrative Order 39 as set out in Attachment A of the Staff Report dated October 25, 2022. Second. Moved by Councillor Cleary, second by Councillor Arthur. Councillor Cleary, anything on it? Uh, listen, I, I think these are all reasonable, and I was, uh, you know, vocal about, you know, my, uh, I don't say opposition, but my preference to not over-regulate the taxi industry anyway. I also didn't want the TNCs to come in until we had the fee approval from the province, but my colleagues disagreed with me, and so we actually get more vehicle miles traveled because of that. But anyway. Damn the environment. Um, so in terms of uh, moving this forward, Totally supportive of it. I'd like to see what ends up becoming of the new uh, education program for uh, local landmarks, streets, et cetera. Uh, I think that's an important part, uh, especially for the tourist trade when folks are being picked up and they say, I want to go to the Citadel. Although I did just go to Google Maps and I typed in Citadel and you get 18 results, National Historic Site, Hotel, the high school. And so, you know, if you're, per, uh, if you're, if you're pretty good at using Google, you could probably find your way around uh, the city pretty easily. So. I do recognize that most people have a GPS or a phone in their car that they use as a GPS and, and that's working quite well. Uh, and I think also looking at this uh, modernization, updating uh, the fact that the industry views these as outdated and also to the winter driving, I was pretty impressed that we were going to require winter driving. I had no idea at the time that it wasn't going to be hands on. Uh, if, if you're not, you know, like young drivers of Canada turning uh, into a, a, a skid and that kind of stuff, I, I thought that's what they'd get. An online course, you know, I don't think it has the same benefit. So I'm fine with, uh, with trashing that as well. Uh, so I think this is reasonable. Uh, I'd like to see where we go from here. And also I'd love to see more uh, that we do for TNCs, but uh, I'll, I'll take another quixotic run at that at some later time. Thank you, Councillor Cleary. Councillor Purdy. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks for the report and for the presentation. Um, I was just curious, who's going to be developing the new training program and how will potential drivers access that program? Um, also, like Councillor Cleary said, I was surprised that the winter driving component was not hands-on. That doesn't make sense to me. But having said that, there are some helpful tip, tips that you can learn if you're not used to driving in winter driving conditions, which can be a little tricky at times, especially with the hills in Halifax, right? Uh, that adds a whole new dimension to winter driving. But like, will, that, will some aspect of that be included in the new training program, do you know? And, oh, the other thing too, I noticed in the jurisdictional scan that only Halifax and Winnipeg required an English language test, and that was kind of a substantial part of, of the financial obligation. I think it was like $100 or maybe more than that. Um, is that necessary, do you think, when, when places like Toronto and Hamilton are not requiring that? that would we have to keep that on the requirements? Thank you. Uh, through to the councillor. Um, as far as the training goes, um, we are going to put an RFP out to um, get uh, new recommendations as far as who would be interested in creating that training program. Um, hopefully, tie-ins will put their name forth as well, but we'll see. Um, I'm sure there's other companies out there as well. Uh, as far as the winter driving goes, um, it could be a possibility to have some of those tips included in the new training um, because, you know, it's part of, part and parcel of, you know, taking care of your vehicle, um, understanding how to drive the city, 
um, being a taxi driver, you know, all of those pieces. So yes, we could definitely include those within the training module. Um, finally, the English. Um, I'm not sure if, I don't think we have it as a requirement legislatively. Um, and it is legislated. So it is legislated. So it would be a requirement. Um, and I, I think it's probably important um, because we have so much diversity within our within our city as well to to have that included. Do you want to add anything, Andrew? No, that's good. good. Yeah. Anything further, Councillor Purdy? You have two minutes, two oh. minutes, 20 seconds left. All right. You're all good? Okay. Uh, so there's nobody further on the board. Uh, if someone would care to call the question. The question's been called. All those in favor? Opposed? Carries. Thank you very much. Great presentation. Really appreciate the work. Uh, moving on to 12.1.2, standing committee appointments to boards and committees. Uh, take a motion. Someone to put the motion on the floor, then we'll walk through the nominations process. Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm happy to do that. I move the Transportation Standing Committee 1, nominate one councillor from Transportation Standing Committee to serve on the Canadian Urban Transit Association until the end of the council term, and two, appoint one councillor from Transportation Standing Committee to serve on Executive Standing Committee effective December 1, 2022, for a term until the end of the council term. I so move. Moved by Councillor Lovely, seconded by Councillor Purdy. All right, so what we're gonna do now, do you have anything further at this point? Nope, she's gone off. So what we'll do is we'll go through each clause separately and ask candidates for appointments to each committee before I, uh, we begin. I'll give the committee an opportunity to ask questions of clarification. Nope, we're halfway through our mandate, makes sense. Uh, so we'll go to Councillor Purdy for a nom, we're looking for nominations first for the appointment to Canadian Urban Transit Association. Councillor mm -hmm. Purdy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to nominate Councillor Pam Lovelace for the Canadian Urban transit. No, no, no. This is, this is. We're, we're no, moving you're on. doing it right, <laughs> Councillor Purdy, and Councillor Outhit is being obstreperous. <sighs> Pay no attention to Councillor Outhit. <laughs> <laughs> Unless he buzzes in and gets in the list. Yes. Okay. So we have a nomination from Councillor Lovelace uh, for Councillor Lovelace from Councillor Purdy for CUDA, seconded by Councillor Outhit. Thank you very much. Very. Kind sir, uh, are there any further nominations for the position of uh, HRM Refacuta? Any further nominations? Any further? Too late to ask. Any further nominations? <laughs> nominations are closed. Congratulations. Oh, do you accept? Oh, there you. Now you can't get out. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll move to the appointment to Executive Standing Committee. Call for nominations. Councilor Cleary. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so uh, I would like to nominate you, and before I say that, uh, it's been my belief all along, although it's not clear in the AO, it really should be made clear, and again, uh, I might take a run at that at some point in time, although I'm not an executive, that's where it should come from, um, that the appointments to executives should be the chairs of each of the committees we have instead of a designate of the committee. If the chair can't do it, if they're too busy, then uh, we can designate someone from the community to go, but it's always been my belief that the chair should, of each committee should be the one to go to executive. So that is why I would nominate you in the chair. Not, not because not. you're a great guy, just because you're great. in the chair. Thank you, no, I won't take that personally at all. <laughs> Moved by Councillor Cleary, seconded by Councillor Lovelace. So I accept the nomination, thank you both. Uh, are there any further nominations for the executive? Are there any? Further nominations, why start now? Any further nominations for the executive? Any further nominations for the executive? I declare myself acclaimed president for life. No, so to the point that Councilor Cleary made, the original redo went of the executive was structured that way. And council at the time, this would have been before 2016 election, voted to make it or alternate. Uh, and I, I actually agree. I think that it should be, you know, if you're going to do a coordinating thing and you've got things like accessibility that crosses all the committees and all the business units going into executive, I think it makes sense for it to be the chair. So yes, Councillor Clear, please take a run at that again. So that completes, so we've got the nominations and they're closed for 12.1.2, but we still require a motion or a vote on the motion that was put on the floor by Councillor Lovelace. Question. Question's been called, all those in favor? Opposed? Noted that Councillor Outfit voted against. Moving on. 12.1.3, uh, Transportation Standing Committee 2023 meeting schedule. 
I look for a motion from Councillor Cleary. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'll move that the Transportation Standing Committee approve the proposed uh, 2023 Transportation Standing Committee schedule as circulated. Moved by Councillor Cleary, seconded by uh, Councillor Lovelace. Uh, it was noted by the clerk, uh, Katie Cott, that the uh, uh, March 2023 meeting is in conf conflict with CPD and uh, AFSC. So that needs to move to March 31st. And I have some, uh, so, so I'll look for someone to move that. But then I noticed that the May meeting is when we're all, those of us that are going to go, are going to be at FCM. So we need to move that one as well. And, and so, uh, so what I'm looking for would be to move the March meeting to March 31st and the May meeting to May 18th. March 31st is a Friday. I'll ask, I will ask as, as we all, I can't load my calendar on this computer. So uh, I'll ask uh, Ms. Campbell if she can have a look and give us a, the correct date. Yeah, the 30th is the correct date. Sorry about 30th. that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for having our back at all times. So, so I would look for, I have a motion then from Councillor Lovelace to do, to move the May meeting, the March meeting to March 30th and the May meeting to May 18th. Move by Councillor Lovelace as their seconder. Seconded by Councillor Cleary. So that's an amendment. Any further discussion on the amendment? Councillor Outfit. I think when we came to, I, I'm going to be away in February, and we, we talked about that during the budget because it's the uh, university reading week. And I thought Sean might have had a thought about that too. I would not be here on the 23rd. I don't know if he would be or not. Okay. So your, your, your mic's not on. You don't mind missing it, huh? I think okay. we, we could have three not here, is what I'm hearing though. So. All right, so let's have a look on February, Katie. Is there an alternate date? Do you want to come back with that, or should we try and do that this minute? Since we're basically done the meeting, I'm willing to wait three minutes. Yeah. yeah. Whatever okay. you want. It'll be right. one second. We can okay. also defer it to the next meeting. So what I'm going to do is we're going to recess the meeting for three minutes uh, while we figure that out, and then we'll come back, and we'll be able to close it out. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that uh, delay while we've worked it out. So uh, are we back live? Yes, we are. Okay, so uh, uh, I believe we have a date. I'll go to uh, Vice Chair Lovelace for uh, the additional change for February. Vice Chair Lovelace. Yes, thank you. So uh, we will move February 23rd to February 16th. Uh, that'll be a one o'clock start. Thank you. Thank you. 
So we'll consider that friendly. Thank you very much for that. That was seconded by Councillor Purdy for the record. Uh, any further discussion on the schedule? Can I just get a clarification? Absolutely, please punch in the, no, you're not on mic. Get on the mic. So Feb 23 moves to Feb 16. March 23 moves to March 30. What was the other change? Uh, May 25th moves to May 18th. May 18th, okay. Right. Merci. All right, thank you very much. Any further questions? Seeing none, we'll move to a vote on the schedule as amended. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Here's your chance to shine, Councillor Othit. No? no. <laughs> All right, we're done with that. Thank you very much. So the motion has been put and passed. There's nothing for members of standing committee. There are no motions. There are no in-camera items. There are no added items. There are no notices of motion. Public participation. Uh, no one signed up as of 2 p.m. Wednesday. Would the one journalist remaining in the room care to speak to us about what he's seen today? No, the answer is no. He shook his head to, into the negative. Uh, so chance to speak going once, going twice, three times. No public participation today. The date of the next meeting is, uh, I think we have to do the December meeting because there's a lot of stuff that we thought would make the agenda and it hasn't yet. So that's December, uh, it says January 26 here, but I think it's, there's no scheduled meeting. So I'm letting the committee know that we're probably gonna have a scheduled meeting around like the second week of December, uh, cause there's a lot of stuff coming and I will email you, I'll work with Katie to make sure that we don't make that too onerous, but we, uh, I think there's a lot of stuff coming that we need to have. So uh, I'll take a mo Okay, well, well we'll communicate with everybody and find out how late we can go and we'll try and get that in there. And if it has to be really, really early, it might not be useful to anybody. So we might not uh, do it until January in that case, but I will try and schedule a meeting if possible. Any further questions on that before we go? Move to adjourn from Councillor Lovelace. Thank you very much. We are adjourned.